Boss Rutan, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much. Good for having me. And good morning. How are you today? Yeah, we're doing great. We're doing great. Had a little bit of a rough night, but you know what? It was nice that you, you're you thinking too much, but uh, it's working. It's California. Sun is shining on the clouds in the sky. I'm looking. No. So I can't come. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I had one of those nights, too. It's like sometimes you get in bed and your heart's racing just a little bit. You get those thoughts going and you just can't get comfortable, right? Just can't, can't get yourself to sleep. If we would only know what it was, you know, so you could fix it. But uh, ah, it is what it is, I guess. Exactly. So, you know, I got to say, I have a, a, a interesting story about how I learned about you because I was actually, I was deployed to Iraq. And um, the first time I saw you was in uh, the documentary, The Smashing Machine with, uh, with Mark Kerr. And uh, that, was a, that was a crazy, crazy story. It was kind of like, my first, uh, we, we, we watched fights and things like that before, but it was the first time I was actually getting into the personalities behind it. And then uh, I started looking you up and uh, learned a lot more about you. you. You've been there since the beginning, pretty much, right? Yeah. We, I, actually, I started fighting before the UFC started. Yeah. Just one month before, because we started September 93, and the UFC was in November, I believe. Oh, so it's just two months uh, before. So let me ask you this, because it seems now you look at the UFC, it almost seems like it's, it's down to a science, right? We, we've been watching these guys for years. We, we know what's going to work pretty much, what's not going to work. You can rate the fighters against each other. But when you were fighting, it was kind of, it was, it was like the wild, wild west. Like you didn't know what was going to work. You didn't know, you didn't know what you were going to be facing in the ring. And, and, and what was that experience like for you? Uh, coming up in this sport in its infancy. It, you know, it, it was cool because, you know, I, I also uh, realized, of course, it's for everybody new. So I always talk like that to myself. You know, if something's freaky, I say, well, so it's for them. It's exactly the same thing. Everybody will feel the same thing. So for me, for me, it was really fun. You know, for me, just to travel for the first time. I've never been on a plane just, uh, because we're in Europe. If we go to France or Spain, we drive by car because it's the same as here in America. It's just states. You know, so uh, to get a 13 hour flight is suddenly arriving in Japan and then you see uh, you've never been in a city like that, like New York and, <clears throat> and Tokyo and, and in London, all these cities there. It's so humongous, you know, you don't even know that it exists. So that was a that was a crazy wake up call for me. And then, of course, you know, that it becomes normal and then you become and they start world traveling and everything that I have and where I travel to, it's all because I started fighting. So. It's really cool, man. It's really cool. And also the, the first hotel that I had, this is so funny because that was across the Tokyo Dome. The Tokyo Dome was, is a place where 70,000 people can fit in. I mean, they play indoor baseball. And we, we fought at places like that. And the hotel room was the Tokyo Green Hotel. I mean, remember, that was my first hotel I had. My feet were literally sticking out of the bed. So that how small the bed was. The closet. I have a picture of the closet that I do this. This was the closet. The width, the width of the closet. And and many years later, I started pro wrestling after I uh, stopped going. And now the Tokyo Dome Hotel was there. That was not there in 93. It's a huge hotel. And I'm filming it. And I say, this is the hotel I started. And then I went to this hotel, which is a state of the art. I said, this is where I'm sleeping now. I say, I guess I did something right. <laughs> because <laughs> I went up and didn't go the other way around. So, yeah, that was a cool moment. And when you were growing up, you, you, you wanted to do martial arts, but your parents tried to keep you from doing it, right? Yeah, they, they, they thought it was violence, you know, like a lot of parents. And my parents are very conservative. So, yeah, they, they were a little bit against it. But uh, they, they allowed me. After two years of asking pretty much every day, they said, okay, fine, okay, go, do it. You know, but then it was, uh, then a couple of months later, because I started picking up really fast, I started training Taekwondo with an adult. Uh, he, who taught me, brought me to the adult classes because my, I had this neighborhood girls, they were super uh, pretty and every guy, so the toughest guy in town was his was him and he, he saw that I was bullied so he took me under the swing and he brought me to the adult classes and from there it went just really fast, like in months I was dropping adults. So then they started talking about me in the dressing room and I overheard these people talking. If you know, I, I, I was a very sick kid, I was a very skinny kid, I had asthma, I had eczema, skin disease, so I got bullied a lot. But, you know, once you hear adults talk uh, about you like that, 
you know, you're going to feel better. And suddenly uh, I got into a fight with the biggest bully in my school. Uh, he surrounded me with like a six, seven kids on a bike, bicycle. They were shouting against something at me and I shouted back, something back. And that was my first knockout. You know, he started and he, uh, he, he told me, hey, hit me, Ruta, hit me, Ruta. Watch out, your hands don't fall off. You know, it was always a leper thing that they had to do because of my skin disease. So I just did what he asked me to do, I guess. And I gave him one punch and it was so, it, I was amazed. Like, I, I realized they're not his friends, those kids. They're just afraid of him because nobody jumped in. Everybody freaked out. And he was out, one punch. Problem was he broke his nose in the process. So then the police showed up at my mom and dad's doorstep. So that was immediately, they took me off taekwondo again. But now I had to, now I had to taste it. Now I started training myself, you know, learning from books and videotapes. And, uh, and that's pretty much where it started. And that's the way it was back then. You literally, you had to go get magazines. You had to order the videotapes from the magazines. They'd have those little, those little uh, ads in the back and things like that. Was, was that how it worked for you? Uh, yeah, or- that was literally it. I would go to the library, you know, and I watched tapes there uh, because we didn't have a VCR at home. And then uh, and books, you know, I was learning katas from books. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how it started. Actually, everybody in town suddenly after I knocked the guy out, you know, because I start imitating Bruce Lee. Uh, and I, I'm just what I can see most of the time I can do. So, you know, I started stretching and, you know, if somebody would say something, I would be, I would be very afraid, but in my mind, I would very, look very cool. And I would made a sidekick and hold the foot in front of his face. And I say, you sure you want to do this, boy? You know, but it was a complete bluff. And then I pulled back and everybody, no, no, they, they didn't want to do it. But if they only knew how scared I was at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but Man, it was, yeah it was cool imagine if you had youtube imagine if you had like youtube or google or anything like that at that point how how how, fa- how much faster and how much crazier it would have been for you yeah i really because then you see other people you, that, that's when you can learn you know also that's where you can do your homework about your opponents and all that stuff that was not in the beginning you know it was very hard to find footage on your opponent or you had to fight in the same in the same organization, then you can get it. But otherwise, you know, there was not a lot out there. There was Shudo, there was Rings, and then there was Pancras. And then in America, we had the UFC. So that was about it. Now, you, you mentioned that as a kid, and you, you, you kind of went over it really quickly, you were bullied. And, and I know you were, you were born with eczema covering your body, and you had severe asthma. Uh, yeah. What kind of, and we hear a lot about bullying these days and the impact that it has and, and uh, its potential for causing things like mass shootings and, and all of these different things. What's your take on this? And Because I know you've done a lot of anti-bullying stuff as well. Yeah, you know, I also do these talks for kids, you know, who go from, uh, let's, from, from, from high school to college or from high school to the work. And, you know, when they leave, they always ask me here in the Thousand Oaks uh, High School if I can come and talk to these kids. And... Uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I always tell them, I said, bullies, you, they're everywhere. You know, you're going to have to simply, you have to make, step up the very first time. When you come there, there's a bully at work or a bully at school. It doesn't really matter. They're everywhere. But if you step up immediately, you know, they only go as far as you let them. So if you, they start immediately say something, they're going to find a, you know, you're going to be a problem. So they're going to figure somebody else out who's easier to intimidate. So you have to really step up the very first time. And unfortunately, yeah, for me, they always say you can't help, you can't hit a bully. Oh, well, well, I got bullied for many, many years and it really hurt. It's like, a, there's a lot of things that I still have. And I, to these kids, actually, I also say, I say, listen, I made a list of all the kids that bullied me. And, and together with other two friends who also got bullied, we made a list with everybody and we gave it after every single person. And so that's what I'm telling the kids. I say, you got to watch out because there's more kids like me. You know, you push too far, they will come after you later in life. So watch out with that. So hopefully they listen to it. And unfortunately, yeah, there's kids who take it a step further. You know, that's where we got school shootings and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you have no clue. I, I, I always tell people, I still remember exactly what they would say to me. Like when they were 12 years old, this is... This is 42 years ago, you know, it stays with you. Now, you know, easy how to deal with it. You learn that, but you know, so I'm just saying you do a lot of damage to a person. And some people are mentally maybe not that strong, you know, and they can snap as something really bad. Or worse, they might kill themselves, you know, and then it's, that's on you. But you know, kids don't know at that age. You know, I was young. I can't really blame them because it looked very gruesome, you know, the, the skin disease. I mean, it was disgusting. I had to wear gloves, I had to wear long, uh, long sleeves, turtlenecks, you know, to try to cover everything up. So it's understandable, but there's a lot of damage been done by just talking. 
I can't imagine what it must have felt like because I, I mean, I have autoimmune disease myself. I have uh, ulcerative colitis and I've, I've had bouts of eczema because of it and mild cases of eczema. I can't imagine what severe eczema all over your body must feel like. That must have been absolutely horrible. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> that, but that, that's how I kept my head above water with everything I always said because I had it on my hands, my arms, my face and my neck. But for the rest of my body, I had little, little spots here and there. But I always told myself, there's always somebody who has it worse than you. There are people who have the worst, when I have the worst on my arms, they have that from head to toe. You know, my asthma attack will be a week, eight days in bed. I knew there's people out there, where people are still out there, that have that 365 days a, week, uh, a year. You know, so then you're thinking, that's the way I always went through everything. There's always people who have it worse than you, you know, and focus on that. So don't complain. I mean, you should be lucky because you could have had that. That's how I always talk to myself. 100%. Uh, you know, back to uh, back to the fighting, I just knowing a bit about your history in fighting, of course, you were known as a striker. You came in and, and uh, you know, did well with that. But you also noticed that you were having issues when it came to grappling and you dedicated yourself to learning grappling for yourself. And for, for a time, you said that you were only going to submit people, right? Yeah, no, well, I just, uh, I fell in love with it. You know, it's... Um... I also, this is in the talks as well, you know, I'm always saying, find something that you love to do, you know, and, and because something that you love to do, you like to do, love to do it a lot. And if you do something a lot, well, you get very good at it. Some people, they say, oh, my, oh, my dream is I want to be get, uh, a guitarist like Jimi Hendrix. I go, well, can you play a guitar? No, I go, that's not your talent. Don't go after that. Go after something that you love, you know, not what you think you are. And, and that is the key to success. And that happened with me with the submissions because I didn't like submissions. Somehow in my mind, it was not, that was not what a tough guy would do. Until when I start focusing on, on suddenly I realized, dude, that's a crazy power to have. I mean, think mm -hmm. about this. I can literally break any bone in your body. I can dislocate any joint in your body. I mean, that's, that's more power actually than a striker. So then when I started and suddenly I got the bug, suddenly my first submission came there and then I start understanding it. And once I start understanding it, I became obsessed with it. I start doing it two, three times a day, every day. But, and I tell everybody, you know, I, I never lost a fight anymore. I won my next eight fights by submission, you know? And I was a guy who lost, at that time, I lost three times by submission. And then suddenly I started submitting everybody. So in Japan, they were like, what the heck is going on? I said, I just put the work in because I loved it. And that's what I tell people. When you love it, find a way to love it. You know, I did that with my stamina too, because stamina was always very hard for me since, because, uh, because of the asthma. So it always, you know, if you get really tired, you automatically shoot into that mode. It's really weird, like it takes over. And then I told myself, listen, if you keep doing this, you can never become a champion. You're going to love how to get tired. And I start programming myself. Like when I would get really tired, I would start trying to enjoy myself and say, oh, I love it. I want it more. I want it more. And I would literally say it out loud constantly, constantly. And suddenly I got that click. Suddenly it went like, oh, now I need to be tired every workout because otherwise I thought the workout wasn't good. You know, so now I, now I made whatever I didn't like, I made it into my strength. I just got the runner's high, so to say, but mm -hmm. then with training. So, and you can do this with everything. And I always tell people, if I can do it, you can do it. You know, this, uh, I'm nobody special. And, and where did you go to learn as far as, uh, as submissions go? Uh, how, how did that, that training uh, come about within your program? Cause uh, I know I, you have to go and you have to find people who are good at it in order yeah. to teach you too, right? Yeah, I had to. So Chris Dolman is the guy who actually got me in the game. Chris Dolman was uh, with the organization Rings. He's kind of the godfather of MMA in, in, in Europe. And he stopped me at one of uh, an event and he said, man, I remember you, uh, you know, you were very athletic. And I, I, I was doing a show there and I came up with backflips and somersaults and all that kind of stuff. And he goes, man, I see all, the, all these crazy things. Did you ever think about free fighting? That was what they called it in the beginning. And uh, he explained to me what it was, that it was money to be paid. I said, sure, sign me up. You know, I, I need a job. So that was great. And then I started trading there. And uh, man, I got I got destroyed the first day. Uh, I literally, I, I called my wife on the way back that I was sleeping in the car because I was in Amsterdam, which is a two hour drive to where I live. I was just crushed. And, uh, and then my wife was laughing the next day. She says, oh, so this is it. The free fighting is over now. I said, no, it's not over. I said, within six months, I'm going to tap all these guys. 
now I now I want payback, you know, and and that's how it worked. So Chris Dolman taught me all the basic submissions, but it was very hard because it's a two-hour drive. I trained mm -hmm. them maybe once a week, you know. Uh, but once I found one person that was Leon Van Dyke. This guy was a freak athlete. He was 19 years young still at the time, super striker, very powerful, and. You know, I would catch him in a submission maybe twice, and then I couldn't catch him in that same submission anymore. So we made each other very, very strong. And we just started experimenting. And I said, listen, I think I can make this better. Is that we have to say? And he goes, why not? Let's try it. And then we, you know, once we started experimenting with submissions, that's when everything started escalating. Because, you know, I realized that, if, for instance, a straight arm bar. Uh, from a mount position. I'm just saying this is the most basic thing that you can do. Everybody knows what you're going to do in your mount. You sit a certain way, you go for a straight armbar. But if you can create a way that that person doesn't know yet, you know, yeah. that is the key to success. And I realized that very early on. So because if I would submit Leon, I would do that twice. And then after I did it twice, I couldn't submit it with that anymore. So I found a different way. But that happened only two, two or three times. I had to find another way. And then I realized if I had three, four different ways to go to the same submission and I start alternating, I go one, two, three, four, three, two, one, four, one, four, three, boom. And suddenly you catch him again. You know, I go, oh, wait a minute. So we start doing that with everything. You know, every single submission. And then I realized, wait a minute, if I escape an armbar, you know, that guy at that moment is a little bit demoralized because I just escaped this armbar. Why don't I go right away in a counterattack? And I start, we start coming up with submission attempts for that, like an escape in a triangle, right away going to a knee bar. People go like, whoa, whoa, what? I go, oh yeah, I'll do it on you. You know, because we did that over and over again. And that, and that was simply the key to success. Just doing it a lot and experimenting with it and always thinking that you can make something better. That's what I tell everybody. But the good thing with me is also I never had a coach. So... I didn't have to pay respect to somebody above me. So because if you if you train jiu-jitsu, for instance, with a guy with a fifth degree uh, black belt, mm -hmm. well, you have to do all the techniques that he's teaching you the way he's doing it. But, you know, some of these techniques, they simply don't work. I have modifications that I use because if I do it the way they do it, well, the submission is not going to work. But I never had to pay respect to a person because I, I was training myself. So mm -hmm. And I truly believe that's what made us strong because... You know, we didn't pay attention to the rules. Everybody who rolled with me, and he said that it, it was just so different because we didn't have the standard grappling. You know, it was, I exploded in techniques. I was just different than other people, and that's why it was successful. So, yeah, there, there was no entrenchment, no, no uh, dogmatic uh, reasoning for why you had to do anything. It was just going after it, figuring out what, what, what works, and kind of treating it like a chess game, right? That, it's really it. You know, you just have to make sure you're covered from all, all angles. You know, MMA is, is, a, is a sport. There's many ways to lose. You know, striking, submissions, you make one mistake, that's it. But many ways to lose. I mean, there's, there's also many ways to win. You know, so it goes back and forth. You have to be ready for everything. And it's very simple. Like in the beginning when I lost my submission, yeah, I realized that if I don't polish up my submission game, well, I might become a champion one time, get lucky. You know, but to keep defending the belt, you know, I think a real champ should at least defend the belt one time, you know, because that's everybody can land a lucky shot, you know, or falls into a, a guillotine submission, your opponent, something, you know, something simple, but, you know, keep defending it. I think that's when you really become the champion. What kind of uh, other surprises did you face as you were, as you were coming up in the sport besides the grappling? Because I know... Again, it's kind of like I remember watching it back then and, and we all had our preconceptions about what martial arts was from watching movies and from, from, from seeing things. But seeing it in real life, seeing two people going at it was a, was a very, very different thing. And then you, you had guys who would look like absolute specimens. They'd come out and they might not do as well. And then you had guys like Fedor who had like a, like a dad bod and he's walking out and then the bell rings and he turns into a crazy savage who's going to kill everybody. Yeah. Like, what, what kind of uh, surprises did you, uh, did you face and, and what surprised you the most? No, you know, that was the thing. Not that much. It's, it, you know, what weird was to me was uh, that I found out on the day of the fight there was no weight classes. So, you know, to go to Japan 13 hours when I was talking to you before and then suddenly fight a guy who was 43 pounds heavier than you. You know, I go, I mean, I come from Thai boxing. We come for five rounds or three minutes, you know, and, uh, and, and weight classes, and now suddenly 42 pounds, that's that's three weight classes up, four weight classes up, you know, it's a big difference. And then, and then finding out that the fight, 
has only one round. I'm super excited, but then you realize it's a 30 minute round. You know, there's no breaks. I go, man, what did I get in my, myself into? But you know, you get used to it. And again, you tell yourself, well, they have the same problems. Everybody's fighting on the cards. They're thinking the same as you, boss. You know, they got what, a half an hour. There's no weight classes. It's all the same. So, you know, once you realize that, it's not that bad. So, yeah, I didn't have really big surprises, I have to say. Now, as far as the training goes, I'm sure it was absolutely brutal. And at some point, drugs definitely penetrated the sport. And, and not just not just steroids, but I'm talking about opiates, painkillers, um, things like that. And I know that you have your own history with painkillers. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because our audience out here, you're talking to the U.S. military veteran community. A lot of them are combat veterans who've been handed opiates and other prescription drugs like like tic tacs um and i know that you had a rough situation where you were trying to get yourself off of opiates and and uh the doctor had actually done some things that that kept you on them and 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 that weren't the best for you yeah so what happens is that this if you haven't uh, once you start with the opiates it will always go wrong that's what i tell people there's never an uh, the sun at the, at the end, uh, there's never an, uh, a rainbow at the end never so it always goes wrong and you have to understand that and but you you know there's moments that you the pain pills don't even work anymore so first of all let's restart so i didn't i stopped in 1999 after i won the title because then i was injured i wanted to do another fight but that's a long story it doesn't really matter i stopped because of a whole bunch of injuries and then 7 years later they asked me if i wanted to fight again and I thought my injuries were gone. And I, so I trained for a week. I said, give me a week because I didn't train for like three and a half years. Uh, I said, give me a week to see where I am, you know? And I go, yeah, I think it's good. My body feels good. So maybe, yeah, let's do this fight. I also did that because at the time I was a little bit of a heavy drinker. And I realized that if I take a fight, I'm automatically going to stop drinking. I have to because otherwise I can't train. So that worked out perfect. And I started training. Three, four weeks, I mean, I'm working circles around the guys, but the, around the top guys who are currently competing. And, and they go like, dude, you have a new career. I go, wow, I feel great. I mean, it's insane. You know, how, how fast I was back into shape, it was just bizarre. And um, then the first injury came back. And then the second injury came back. And another one. And another one. And my rip was out. And I blew my hamstring. And my, and my kneecaps. And I, the, everything started to go bad. So I started getting pain pills from the Dr. Norcos. And I remember the... The, the day of the fight, I, I think I took one or two in the morning, but I took them early, like nine o'clock, because I wanted to be out of my system when I was fighting, you know, because you get a little loopy and maybe that might affect your reflexes. So let's not do it when I'm fighting. So I did early in the morning. And then after the fight, of course, when the injuries were there, still there, you know, now you don't have a fight anymore because you just fought. Also, now I can take a, a, a pain pill for when I have pain again. And that goes from that moment, it goes really fast. You know, then you, you know, like I always say in an interview, I remember there was a moment that I wrote a nine on the mirror with my wife's uh, whatever they have for makeup. And uh, and I said, I'm not going to go over nine pills a day. And those nine pills, they, yeah, they become 40. And people go like, there's no way. I said, they literally become 40. And that's when you make the switch to OxyContin because OxyContin has less Tylenol in it. And Tylenol is really bad for your stomach. So if you take too many Vicodins, Vicodins, they have way more Tylenol. Then you go to Norco. And if Norco, you start taking those a lot, you go to OxyContin because it's the same feeling. But now we're talking about synthetic heroin, you know, and, and I started taking that. And then I realized one day when I came back, I had a five-hour delay with a flight. And I believe I came from Boston and I was in the plane shaking because I ran out of pills. And that's when I realized I had a problem. I kind of knew it before, but I never was in that situation. You know, one of those idiots who tried to put his head in the sand and say, ah, oh, no, it's okay. I just take a pill, it's okay. But it's not okay anymore, it goes wrong. So I started with Suboxone. Suboxone is kind of like the methadone uh, that they use to get off of heroin. I have a friend who's on that right now and he's having a lot of problems with it. The, it's the worst stuff. And uh, the worst with me is they never told me to get off of it. They said it will help for the pain as well. I did that for three and a half years. This is stuff you can do for maximum two weeks. You have to wind up because otherwise you're dependent on that. And sure, you can build it up. But this stuff, it goes into your bones. It goes to, it is the worst. You have double vision all day long. Everywhere I'm sweating, my heart rate is up. I mean, the side effects are bizarre. I mean, eight times to the restroom in the middle of the night. I mean, all that is gone when I stopped it. But to kick Suboxone, 
Well, that was a very hard thing to do. They say it's harder than from the OxyContin. It's better to go through five days and then you get rid of it because the, uh, the, the, the Suboxone is so invested in your bones and everything. It takes a long time. My doctor had never seen anything like it. I did it in 11 days. And, and that, was, that was a very hard 11 days. My testosterone level, you should understand, was five. People go, oh, 500. No, five. Wow. So women have 60 or 70. Uh, the doctor was there freaking out. He shaved, uh, pushed his papers to another doctor. He says, check this out. And the other doctor goes, like, he said, how do you get out of bed? I go, well, it's very difficult. <laughs> you know, I have to really force myself to get out of bed. He says, people, if they go under 100, guys, they won't even uh, go to work anymore. They're completely crushed. You got five. I've never seen anything like it, he said. And that's also because of the Suboxone. Your friend's going to get the same stuff. you got to tell your friend he's not need to get off of it. And he really has to because that will always go wrong. And the great thing about Suboxone is you can actually, every time you can take a little bit less. You know, right. and people, I took a one and a half pill a day, which is like 10 milligrams, I believe, or 12 or something. And, and I just jumped right away to three quarters to half of that. I didn't feel any difference. So I go, wow, that's good. Then you go to one and then, you know, slowly but surely. And then you start literally going from one third to one, one, one fourth and one fifth, like little tiny bits, because believe it or not, they still work. And then you do it once every other day. So once you're all the way down, like I'm talking about half a milligram, you know, from that moment on, still, it's going to be hard to kick it because you're going to, yeah, you're going to feel really bad. It's, it's a bad stuff. He's been trying to get off of them for a while. And uh, the thing is, he runs a farm. So, so he's oh. got so many responsibilities that he has to take care of on the farm. And if he goes down, then, then the farm doesn't get run. So the thing is, oh. he's in this kind of vicious cycle right now where he's, he's <clears throat> trying to do this. Plus, I also heard that um, Suboxone, it blocks anything else that you're going to take, right? So like yeah. as far as pain relief, right? Yeah. So when I did, they gave me testosterone shot. I didn't feel anything from that. When I was off the Suboxone and I didn't take a testosterone for, for a while, but once I was off of it and they gave me the first testosterone shot, dude, it was like I was 20 years old, uh, young again. It was the most insane feeling. Then I, I went, okay, now I understand what the fighters are feeling and why they want to do this crap. Because you feel like you're rejuvenated. It's an insanity. I was like, almost like an ecstasy pill. You feel that good, you know? So, uh, and, and, that's, and that's the thing where they get addicted to. You know, they want that feeling again. And guess what? Same with steroids, same with every other medication. You have to get more every time in order to get the same effect. So thankfully for me, I never went after that because I didn't want to do it because I see these guys taking these insane amounts, which is simply not good. So, yeah, but your, your, your buddy, tell him that he, at least he has to start going. I don't know how much is he's taking. And otherwise, just uh, write an email to me after the show and I will tell him how I, uh, how I did it because it's, it's important. You got to talk about amino acids and all this kind of stuff. And that, that will help tremendously. And, and you know what? Believe it or not, that I didn't know it at the time, but now I'm a freaking big proponent of it. If I would be in a situation right now, I would smoke weed, 100%. I would yeah. not have that problem. Is that what you do for pain right now? That's what I do for pain right now. And I almost don't have pain. So right now, the only thing I use weed for is to go to sleep. And I use a one-to-one -one ratio, like a one CBD, one part CBD, one THC. So it's a really light version. Take one zip and it works every single day. Now, if I would smoke during the day, which I, I was just thinking about it yesterday, that's been in July that I, you see, so I never did. And that was in Holland when we were there visiting for my daughter. She was going to get married. That's when I went to a coffee shop and, you know, we smoked a joint. But that's, I, I never smoked during the day because it takes me down. And it's my, it slows my mind down. I can't memorize as well. So yeah. I only use it to go to sleep and a light version of it. But it always works. When I did the first time, I was like, it was the pain that I was gone. And I go, man, I wish I would have listened to my friends years ago because they were all doing it for pain. And I always thought, ah, that's not real. They just say that because they want to smoke, you know, but uh, yeah. it wasn't, they were right. hundred percent. Yeah. I got my, my medical card for, uh, for the ulcerative colitis, uh, a few years ago, actually. And I started taking it. And, um, the thing was it, it, I don't like the way it makes me feel during the day. Yeah. So I stick with CBD, a really high CBD ratio. Um, but, uh, but, and, and I can't touch edibles or some of that crazy shit yeah. that they got going on because mm -hmm. That just puts me into like a crazy psychological hole. Yeah. But, uh, oh, but wow. I see so many benefits from it. Yeah, I, I you know, I do, uh, 
I wouldn't edible. I would only do like maybe on a Friday if if I have a lot of pain and I don't have to do the whole th- nothing for the weekend because the edible stays so long in your system, you know, and it affects my mind so much. Yeah, I don't I don't take those anymore. It's the it's too much. And I listen. I'm talking about taking five or ten milligrams. Um, people go like, oh, I know guys. <laughs> I was doing a podcast with Joey Diaz. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's a front smoker, everybody knows. And I remember he took eight stars in one sitting. And a star is 250 milligrams. Oh, and I go to like one star will keep me in bed for three days at least. I'll be crushed. I did it one time with 60 milligrams. I was destroyed the next day. I was laying in bed all day long. I go down 2,000 milligram. He ate like in an hour and a half. I don't know how that's even possible. You see, so with me, I found, thankfully, I found out that we always want more than we really need. Mm-hmm. It's really like that. You can simply say no. If you simply do half, sure, it might not work today as good as well, but tomorrow already works better. And then a day later, it works better again because, you know, your body gets off the big doses and then suddenly it gets simply used to a smaller dose. And if you feel that you smoke too much, what I do sometimes also, I just stop for two weeks and then you'll be amazed. Like, for instance, once you feel that you go up, you have to smoke more. Let's say from a vape pen, I just make an example, like you have to take three three drags of 10 seconds or eight seconds, whatever that it takes. You know, if you stop two weeks, you go back and you don't even have to take one whole one because your body resets immediately. That's how fast it goes back with the THC. And that's what I love about it. It's it's a non-addicting. Yeah, there's cases from, there's always people who get addicted to something, but you, know, you have people addicted to sex, to this, to what, whatever. And there's always people who step out, but uh, for the rest, you it can't, legal dosage that's uh, a lethal dosage there is no lethal dosage right yeah. i mean you need pounds of it and nothing will happen so yeah i, I mean it. i've lost two people so far this year just from opiates and like i said our community's been been ravaged by it um it's it's been absolutely insane have you yeah. looked at kratom at all um, yeah i actually i'm taking that also yeah yeah but but kratom also you have to watch out i realized really fast yeah you know, because you start with six, right? They say six. You say, oh, that's a lot. No, no, no. Because if you take six, that will work for seven hours. It's not mm-hmm. like an, a, taking a Vicodin where they go, boof, and you jump down. Kratom doesn't have that. It stays longer. And then once I realized I was taking eight, and suddenly I was taking 10, immediately I, I recognized, I go, okay, wait, back to six. Next day I did six, didn't feel any difference. You know, mm-hmm. and then I went to five, four, three. Then I stopped for like uh, five weeks. And so just that I can check myself. Okay, see, had nothing, no problem to wean off of it, zero. So now I know that, you know, simply you can take one pill less every day and there's no no side effect. You don't, you don't have that, no sweats, no nothing, you know, completely different than with pain pills. Yeah, and the benefit there is that, you know, there's not really an overdose. If you take too much of it, you're gonna get sick. You're not gonna feel good, but it's not gonna kill you. Um, and then the other part of it is uh, it's, it's not, eight dollars a pill like like some of these other things i i don't get how you must have been rack rolling through money when you were doing 48 a day that must have been insane <laughs> well i got it from the insurance you know i had the doctor and the doctor prescribed it me i had the doctor i got him by his throat uh because when i asked for suboxone he didn't want to give it to me he says no you can stay on the pills i go dude you you turned me into an addict you know, and he said, yeah, but I don't want to do it. So I went for him and I I, I was going to get a stone. And he goes, well, what? I say, you're going to prescribe me this shit. And, and he was like, okay, 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 I'll do it. I said, dude, you made me like this. You were giving me the whole time. Sure, I'm taking it myself. I got to take responsibility for that. But the way they bring it, it's like, oh, no, don't worry about it. You know, it's less time and all that, you know. They, yeah. it, it, it's something like, and then you have those pills, the Suboxone. Well, that's for them the same amount of money they make. So those guys are not going to say that you're going to have to wait over it in two weeks because then they lose a customer. It's one big, it's one big pusher deal. You know, these are just drug uh, people who sell drugs. That's what they literally are doing. Those guys, they should be, yeah. that should be penalties for those guys. You know, I mean, sure. I'm taking it myself, but if you look at the guys and where they give it for nowadays, it's ridiculous. You know, if you go to my, the dentist, my daughter was uh, 15 and she had a to- uh, put, uh, tooth pulled and I want to give a Vicodin. You know, my wife man, there's no way. You're not prescribing that crap. She's 15 years old. How can you do that? You see, in Holland, that doesn't work. In Holland, you don't have that. So, but then we also don't have the people who are addicted to it. Look at the right. crisis we have. It's insanity. 
Right. And that's the, that's the thing. And, and the thing is too, all these things hit people differently. If I take an opiate, I'm wired. Like yep. I, I, I'm wired. I, I, I feel great. I want to work. I, I'm not lazy on it or anything like that. It juices me up like crazy. Um, other people, they, they get, you know, super brain fog, super sleepy, things like that. But uh, if you're wired to, to get the energy from it, that's where you got to really watch out because that's what's, what's really addicting. Yeah, no, you, you, nobody knew in my circles. Mm -hmm. Not even my friends knew. So, and I, I was on TV. I mean, weekly show with Inside MMA. Nobody knew. You can't tell. You know, you can't control it. The weird thing is this, though. A long time ago, as for a party thing, somebody gave me an 80 milligram. And nobody told me to break it in half, right? So I, I popped the whole thing. And the guy, was he, he had to go somewhere. It was a friend of mine. And he go, what did you do? I said, I took it. And he said, you took the whole thing. I go, yeah. I go, is that wrong? He says, dude, I'm not. Right. So he called off. He says, I'm going to stay with him because I don't know. I mean, you never take this crap. And I was crushed. I was like, I couldn't, I mean, that was 80 milligrams. Uh, and then later in life, when I got addicted to it, I was taking those 80 milligrams 10 a day. I mean, think about that. Then the first time I took one, I couldn't work. I couldn't go to the restaurant. I mean, I was sick, I was sweating. I go, but how can people function on this stuff? But you know, you get used to it. And suddenly you're realizing you take 10 of those freaking things a day. It's, it's, it's crazy. That's Scary. Insane. Yeah. So now you know you're 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 how old are you now boss you're 54 54 and you're at this point in your life the the last fight you took was i think was it 2006 or 2000 2006 and and you're at this point now where you're looking back at your career you you, you were a pioneer um what do you have going on now what are, what are you doing I, you know, a lot of stuff. I do, uh, you know, this is an acting job in the works now. So, and I will, uh, once that is all said and done, then I'm, I'm going to tell people. I invented a long training device that I, uh, that I invented when I was like 14, 14 years old. And, uh, and I finally stopped making it like nine or 10 years ago. And, and it cured me from my asthma literally within three weeks. And then I sent it to my buddy in Holland who has asthma. Eight days. He says, I want to sell them. He's selling them now in Europe. So we have a hundred percent success, success rate with asthma. You know, it's, it's crazy. And then I start working. I found out that the trainer from Usain Bolt is a very smart guy. They do inspiratory training with O2 trainer, you know, so everything started falling together and, and he has like 18 published medical journals and a published medical journal. I don't know for the people at home, that means it's clinically proven what it does. You know, it's not like on the bottle when it says clinically tested, if something says clinically tested, don't buy it. Because that's just, they just try to buy you that stuff by the, you putting a word clinically in it. Test it. You need to see clinically proven. What was the result of that test? That's what you should ask these people. Because if that result would have been good, it would have said clinically proven. So if it says clinically tested, pretty sure it's not a good product. You know, and now with the O2 trader, you know, now I have clinically proven. I got published medical journals. So now it's starting to get more uh, fire. So thankfully. So really good to, to, to working together with the guy from Usain Bolt. He was a very, he's a very smart guy. That's awesome. So you you literally created this thing, and then you you saw a problem, you solved it, and 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 you created the solution. Now it's just about getting out there, getting the efficaciousness uh, demonstrated, and then from there it's just about figuring out distribution and, and figuring out supply chain, right? Yeah, but it's, and you know, it's, it's harder than everybody thinks and it patterns and, you know, I'm so much money I put in there and now people want to be my partners, but you know, then they want also a lot of money, like a 40%. And I've been every, doing everything myself. We've been over $400,000 in now with all the patterns and the, and the continuation patterns and the worldwide patterns because I have to, since it's curing asthma for us right now, you know, so I, I cannot not have a pattern, but boy. That's cost a lot of money and just the shipping and the handling and bringing it over from China. Everybody says, oh, it's 50 bucks. You probably make some for $8. Yeah, but to get them here with everything, it's like 14 bucks. I'm talking about the commercials and everything. So then, you know, you do it three times uh, the amount of money and that's where you sell them for. That's how pretty much every product works. That's how they come to a price point. But I'm telling people this, it's a 50 bucks thing. It's going to cure you for me asthma. And if you don't have asthma, it's going to do crazy wonders for your breathing. It will force you, will teach you to breathe the correct way. Just that is going to increase your stamina insane immediately, like literally two days later. 
because a lot of people breathe in the, the wrong way. They lift their shoulders when they breathe. And with the O2 trainer, you have to do breathing exercises. You have a lot of resistance while breathing in. Well, if you lift your shoulders, there's no way you can pull that air in. You've got to be forced to use your core. And that's the way you're supposed to breathe. And man, it's, uh, it's crazy. Like for instance, an example is that you have to only do 30 repetitions a day. There's a certain exercise you have to do. You have to blow out, lean over, and then put the auto trainer in your mouth and then inhale with force through resistance. And, you, and then you go forward again. You do 30 times. It takes about three minutes, three and a half minutes a day. That's it. You don't have to do anything more. But you know, people, three minutes becomes a long thing for people, right? It's always like that. They think, oh, it's nothing, but it's a workout. I'm telling you, if you see my core right now, it never looked like this. It's a really wow. thick core. I have bodybuilders now start using it because you use different muscles. They never trained those kind of muscles. My top uh, abs underneath my chest, they always, they stick out now because they, I use the outside muscles to breathe. I use different muscles than I did before. And it's, uh, it's crazy. If I do stamina twice a week, I just blow through my stamina things. It's, it's, it's really a, a, a bizarre thing. It works that well. And uh, hopefully more people are going to see it because 50 bucks, it doesn't cost a lot. It's yeah, a and so thing. 50 bucks is a great deal for something that could potentially save you thousands of dollars in the future on medications and therapies and things like that. Yeah, for me, I, I don't use an inhaler anymore. I had an inhaler everywhere with me. I have to. Because if I would sneeze violently, my lungs would close up. Every asthma patient has that. You know, if I would take a sprint, 20 seconds, I would stand still. And then about a minute later, boom, lungs are closing. And if I don't have an inhaler, that's a problem. So everywhere I travel, before every single fight I had, I had to spray my lungs open in the dressing room. And from that moment on, I keep on, keep on going. But now with the O2 trainer, I don't even have an inhaler with me. Not even, even my baggage, nothing, not even a backup thing because it's completely gone. That's a freedom. It's a big freedom for an asthma patient. Wow. Now, there's this issue of traumatic brain injury um, that, that seems to be hitting everywhere in sports. It's hit us in the veteran community. And you know, since we found that, that you can sustain a traumatic brain injury just by getting your head jarred a little bit, um, say if you're manning a 50 cal machine gun or if you, are, uh, if you have a hard landing in a helicopter or something like that, um, what in your mind has been the effect on the sport of MMA and where do you think the sport is going with this? Well, and thankfully it's going better. Thankfully we have now guys who start, you know, to think still there's some fighters who like their fighting style. For instance, just engage you an example I'm using always because he doesn't mind to get hit. And I told him before he went to the UFC, he was fighting for the world series of fighting where I was a competitor. I said, dude, you shouldn't do that. Just let him miss. Why, why would you, like, it is, that's my style. I go, yeah, but you want to be able to talk to your kids later, right? When you're going to get kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, it's a big thing. So, and then it's last fight. I saw him and I go, he started using head movement and he started letting them miss. You know, okay, now watch his career. <laughs> this guy, he, he, he might get a new career just by doing that. You know, people need to understand that taking shots is, is not a tough guy thing. To, it's a dumb thing to do. It's, if you can't avoid it, why would you do it? They always say, oh, you, you're good. I say, yeah, because I, I don't, I try to avoid getting hit. <laughs> why, why would I? I don't mind getting hit. But if I can avoid it, why, why not? It makes no sense. Uh, it, it's insane to me that people don't think like that. So I think it's going to be much better. We saw those guys. We have a few guys. Uh, Gary Goodrich, unfortunate. He's a really uh, good guy. I love that guy. And he is heavily affected by it. His memory is affected by it. He is uh, to see him in the state that he is in now and to know that guy before. It was a, such a great guy. He's still a great guy, but you know that he's such an outgoing guy and he can't do that anymore. He's like just completely a different person, you know? So and, uh, it hurts, but what's CBD? When we come back to CBD, I went to uh, uh, a talk here about CBD and there was a, a, a brain surgeon was going to come. And they gave that brain surgery. It was just two months ago. They gave it for the first time CBD. And he went on stage and he said he didn't believe in anything. And then they had two identical cases on the field. And one case, they gave him CBD immediately after the person was hit. And the other one, they didn't. And he, this guy started giggling. And he was like, I don't know why you got... He said there was, it was a high number. He goes like 32% less brain swelling uh, with the guy who took the CBD. And nobody reacted. And he says in the, in the microphone, he goes, I don't know. He says, if it was 2%, it was already big. 
I said, 32%, you guys have no clue what it is. That was just the very first time we tried it. He says, I'm so excited about this because it takes the inflammation away immediately. So you see this a lot now in the NFL. and They immediately, after they get hit, they give them CBD because that gives that barrier. It takes care of the inflammation so it can't start inflaming because inflammation is pretty much the cause of every disease, right? So mm -hmm. CBD again comes in da -da 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 -da, and they're, uh, they're helping. So... I think once they start getting even further with that, I think it's going to help us. And, 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 and what I don't mind is the weight cuts. I mean, they already uh, did it different, but I think that's the biggest problem. That's why you see it a lot because you take care of all, the, if you drain all the fluids, well, you drain your brain fluid as well. And now you don't have that airbag, so to say, in your brain. You know, that's the problem why they, you know, so many boxers are affected by it. Yeah, what about uh, the fact that you can no longer do IV rehydration afterwards? Do you think that that, that was a wise call or do you think that was something that, that they're going to regret? No, I think it's a wise call because you now you force your fighters to, to fight in the weight class mm -hmm. that they're supposed to be fighting in. Listen, and I never had that problem. I never cut weight. I actually had to gain weight at my world title fight because I was too light and I needed to be over a certain amount. Otherwise, I couldn't fight for the title. It was just going to be a regular fight. I had to drink waters. And I was already on the dressing room, uh, on the, the scale with my jeans and with everything on. And I was still three pounds under, you know? So I never had it. I always gave my body all it needs. You know, I would never cut weight. And, 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 and don't look at weight. They, this is the thing it's, from fight. it's never their fault. You know, it's always a reason when they lose. And that's the problem. You got to simply, you know, it's like when you're an addict, you got to you gotta acknowledge that you have a problem. And that's the same in fighting. You know, you didn't lose because that guy cuts more weight and is stronger the next day. Make up with technique, right? That, that's, that is not an excuse, you know, because he, he can, he's able to cut more weight. And that's why he's heavier in the fight. Really? We're talking about two pounds heavier, three pounds? That's going to make a difference in the fight? It's not. You know, blame right. it on yourself. Get better. Get better with technique. Don't start cutting more weight, suddenly go to a different weight class, even lower weight class. No, you got to go to a higher weight class. That's what your body is telling you. You're not functioning correctly. Water is the most important thing in the body, next to oxygen. Oxygen is number one. Water is number two. You know, oxygen, three minutes, average, four minutes, you're dead. Water is three weeks. Without that, you, oh no, three days, sorry. And, uh, three days. Three days, and, and you're dead. So that's the next one. And, and you want to, Pull that all out of your body while it's the number one thing that you have to put in. Very scary. I wouldn't do it. Right. Yeah. I used to, I used to dehydrate bodybuilders before shows. Um, yeah. I, used to, I used to coach them and uh, they'd be at death. A lot of people don't realize it. When those guys step on stage, they're at death's door um, yeah. it, when, when they look like that. And, uh, and it's a, it's a crazy thing to watch. It's crazy to see what happens to their brains. It's crazy to see what happens to their dige digestive systems. It's insane. Yeah, look uh, at the women. The women, some of them can't get babies anymore because they cut way too much weight. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, what about gloves? Um, I, I know you were an advocate for, for bare knuckle boxing for a bit. Um, do you think that the gloves have, have definitely contributed to this problem? Yeah, for sure. You know, because, uh, yeah, you mentioned it already. It's uh, like a lot of people know now, but the glove is indeed it's invented to protect the hand, you know, but a, a normal person on the street, they think it's protected to protect the head, but it's not because people were breaking their hands left and right. That's why they came up with the glove. Now you have a glove. Now you can hit as hard as you can. You can do that with bare knuckle boxing. You, you can, but you're going to break your hand if you hit a skull, yeah. you know? So that's why bare knuckle boxing, CTE wise, I'm saying, is safer than regular boxing because they have to, a good, a, a good bare knuckle boxer will hold back on his power on his face. They will go for the body. They start hunting there because if they hit a skull, they're going to break their hand and they can't defend their title. You know, so yes, they have more cuts and lacerations. You have that, but that's about it. I, I would choose that over brain damage, you know? So yeah, bare knuckle boxing is safer, but to say that to people and they go like, ah, uh, you know, people oh, yeah, that's barbaric. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> because they see all the blood that they think it's a big thing. But you and I know, you know, you're cut and it's a little tiny cut and well, your heartbeat is 160 beats a minute. It's pumping out like crazy. It looks like you know, all your face is completely destroyed and they wipe it off and you see it's a little tiny cut. People go, oh, that's it. You know, it's, yeah. it just looks horrible. It's not that bad. Uh, absolutely. Well, Boss, I, I want to thank you so much for coming on here. I know, I know we're coming up on time right now. 
Um, but, uh, you know, huge admiration for you for, you know, everything you've done throughout your life, you know, stepping into a sport that, that was, you know, for all intents and purposes, just budding at the time. And, and, you know, it's become this amazing thing this what I think is the, the, uh, the last real pure sport out there, uh, as far as competition goes. And, uh, you know, you're a giant in that community and, uh, I really appreciate you coming on here, speaking honestly and speaking to our community of veterans. Oh, you're very welcome, man. Very, military, very close to me. I, uh, I love the military. I teach a lot, the military from elite special forces to everything to, to the Marines. I see the Marine Corps flag on the background there, yeah. you know? So yeah, no, I, I, I love you guys, man. It's uh, people have no clue how hard of a job that is. You know, that is, that, that's for fighting. You know, they always say, oh, I'd rather die in the cage. Well, first of all, I don't, not me, I'll tap. You know, I have a family that I love so much. I said, well, let's talk about dangerous things. And I always get the military. I said, that's, you make a mistake there, you're dead. They're going to shoot you in the head or the body, whatever, you, you're dead. We don't have that. We have a referee, man. There's no, nobody dies, you tap and it's over. It's really not that dangerous what you guys do. That is the dangerous stuff. And you do it for this country. And, and I, that's very admirable, man. I, I love that. I'm a, I'm a huge patriot. I appreciate that so much. Where, where can people connect with you online? Is, it, is Twitter the best place? Uh, Instagram? Yeah. I would say Twitter for because I, that's where I answer questions if I have time. Because I, I really started going down in, uh, in social media. I did this Exodus 90 thing. This is a Catholic thing for 90 days in uh, where you have crazy things that you can't do. I mean, you have to take cold showers, you have to work out, you can't eat sweets, you have two fasting days, no alcohol, no TV, no sporting games, no, no phone, only for your work. I mean, for 90 days, it was a hard thing. But you know, I realized, wow, social media is taking a lot of time away from me. So once I realized that, um, I kind of left it like that. You know, I will answer people's questions, but I'm not a big post guy who, Every day starts posting. That's that's just not me because I want to spend more time on myself. It's more important. That's that's an amazing perspective. I'm I'm a fellow Catholic too. I got my uh, rosary ring right here. Nice, and, very uh, good. <laughs> I definitely I definitely love that aspect of the religion. So, um, yep. well, again, man, thank you so much um, for everybody out there. You know, kind of go back through this episode. I mean, listen to some of the things that Boss has said here about his own experience with drugs, with fighting, with, with everything, go through, take some notes and, you know, form your own questions. Uh, let us know what you're thinking and, and, and what types of things that you're working on right now. And above all, get out there and live your best lives while you can guys. We're only here for a short time. Make the most out of it. That's it. You know, and make sure, you know, get your stuff in order for to go upstairs because I 100% I had a bad experience with the ghost that attacked me in my old home. I mean, I see things fly around. My family is literally curtains up against the ceiling with everything closed. You know, it's, uh, yeah, somebody Holy went crap. after me. Yeah, I want you to realize that's how I got back into the faith because I knew if that's evil there, you know, then it's 100% good as well because it's the only way you can drive it away. And that's what I got invest. You just talk about the rosary. I've been doing that for four years. I do it every day. You know, there's no one day that I skip. You know, I, I, I actually invest a lot. I go daily mass. I, I, I do a lot of work in there. And, and people go like, wow, what are you doing? I said, listen, every time I add something, I'm feeling better. You know, mm -hmm. so I just keep doing what I'm doing. I, I, it, takes, it takes a while what I'm doing in the morning. My whole stretch routine, my prayers that I've got in, that takes an hour away already. You know, people say, I don't have the time for an hour. Oh, make time. Step, wake up an hour sooner. That's what mm -hmm. I do. But you know, it, I can't tell you. I mean, people talk about confession. People talk about all the all the ritual, the Catholic Church, and how how they don't like it. Confession to me is free therapy. I mean, it's it's literally you go in. You, I feel like a million dollars when I step out of it. And and again, I'm not trying to shove that down anybody's throats, yeah. but but it's helped me immensely. I converted when I was 23 years old in the Marine Corps uh, before deployment, and uh, it was it, it was an amazing change for me. So. Yeah, me too. It helped me tremendously. My wife is much happier about me. I cleaned everything up. Yeah, well, the only thing the friends see from me is that I don't use profanity anymore. That's so here and there they go like, hey, I never heard you shout anymore. That's pretty much the only thing that they, they see different because normally they believe that if you go to daily mass and you don't live your life, I go, well, look at what I'm posting. I'm shooting, I'm shooting bows, I'm doing, I'm doing everything. We're having a really good time. That's really not it. For somehow they think that Catholicism is boring. 
you know, but I'm, I'm always telling them, once you get invested in it, you start learning about it, there's all the sayings that you have. You can't handle the truth. Whatever saying is out there, 90% of them, they all come from the Bible. You got to realize, wait a minute, this book is far ahead. They tried to debunk this thing for over 2,000 years and it didn't work, you know, because it's still, it is still there. And then especially with me, with the evil that I experienced, you know, that was, that was the set for me. And so once I did that, that I challenged the ghost and I did this whole, uh, well, I, I have now a good friend of mine, Father Ripka, he's an exorcist. And he said, well, only you, boss, because that was, a scare, that, that was not smart to go after the ghost. Because I said, listen, you're taking me into sleep. Why don't you do it now? You know, you suck at punching me. Let's bring it down to my level. I would love to fight you. You know, and that's when I start challenging it. And somehow I got rid of it. So uh, it worked really well. But if I felt that evil, I knew that automatically that was that good. And it's the only way to get rid of it. So, yeah, get your affairs in order. Because a lot of people, they go, ah, oh, it's BS, it's BS. I've been living proof. I felt it. You know, it was a very scary thing. So, uh, no, it's 100% there. This is nothing. Go do DMT one time. You know? I've done uh, it. I've <laughs> done it. 100%. There's, there's atheists who do DMT. They come back and they go, okay, sorry, I believe. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because immediately you go like, this is no way. This is the life. You're in yeah. a complete different world. You know? It opened my, it made my faith stronger when I right. did that. Now I know 100% that we're all connected. You know? It's... Uh, it's cool, man, this life. I can't wait what's uh, going to come. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an amazing story. I'm from New England, and we're loaded with ghosts in New England, as, as you probably know, and, and grew up with that stuff. And, uh, and like you, when I did DMT, it just, it just solidified my faith in everything. It was, yeah. it was absolutely insane. Yeah, that's my um, next thing. I want to do the, the ayahuasca now because now I want to, because you know, it's cool how time stops, right? Like yeah. it looks like you've been like gone for an hour, but it's just four minutes, you know, yeah. because there is no outside time and space. We're out, outside there. There is no time. And you mm -hmm. really feel that. From people who say that they have near death experience, they come back and they felt like time stopped. Well, that's exactly what you're feeling, right? I go, man, this is so awesome. You know, we're really going to something else, you know? It, I, I think you're a complete idiot if you look around and think that it's not the case. You know, they all say, oh, these people, the religious people, they're stupid. They go like, I, I, for me, it's exactly the other way around. I said, dude, if you don't see it, look around. Look around. How is it possible that we can all live together, work together, do all that stuff? We should be killing each other. That's how crazy as well, although it's happening a little bit of politics right now. Right, right. Know, people are getting out of control. But, you know, trust me, it, look into it. Because I'm always saying, if from all the millions of near-death experiences, right, from all of them, if one is true, it's true. Right. And if it is true, you didn't get your stuff in order. I always talk about this, the highway to hell, they sing. They think about the stairway to heaven. They're, they're anticipating the traffic, <laughs> you know. They know a lot of people. There's near-death experience. I challenge people, go on YouTube, who went to hell. GloriaPolo.com. Go to that one. That's one of the most known cases, translated over like 60 languages. And what that woman went through, she, ex she will explain to you how it felt to go to hell. And that was a, a, a you know, listen, I don't want to go there because it's for eternity. So, yeah, exactly. Just look into it. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, boss. Uh, this has been an amazing conversation. And uh, we're going to have to get you on again sometime to talk about those psychedelic experiences because uh, that's, that's definitely something that I think more people need to look into, but only when they're ready, right? Yeah. Um, They've got to be ready for it. So, yeah, do your homework. Do with good people. You know, Portland, right, is the first one. Now, I I, I read like a month ago who uh, who proved everything. You can take mushrooms. It's uh, it's illegal to do that now. Mm -hmm. And 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 yes, you know, if you look at the uh, the spirit molecule, jo Joe Rogan, that's his mm -hmm. documentary for the yep. people at home. If you don't know what it is, watch that. Go to YouTube, the spirit molecule, and watch that. And then you see Harvard professors and everybody is doing it and what they're talking about. With me, this is a fun story just before I leave. So they told me that you could ask everything you want, you know, and, and, and see where you want to go. So first, I wanted to see God. That was that was my vision. So I smoked and suddenly everything becomes like the telescope, right? Like, dig, 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 dig. Mm -hmm. And I'm closing my eyes and I shot away from the planet, like literally shoot away yep. from the planet. And I'm flying in space. I go, oh, Oh man, this is wild. And so I start flying in space and go, well, let's see if I can go warp speed, right? <laughs> because you want to do. And whoop, I started. I go, oh man, this is crazy. And then suddenly I'm at this big, the Grand Canyon of a, a wormhole, like a giant thing. And I'm looking, I see things going in buses, trees, really weird. And I go, something told me I got to go in there. So I wanted to go in there, but just before I dove in, somebody in the room who was walking around touched me. 
and I stepped out of it because that's the thing with DMT. It doesn't do anything physically, but you get touched and you go, oh, you're out. And th that's it. And I wanted to go back. I said, dude, I, I need to go back because I, I needed to go into the wormhole, but it didn't work anymore. So I came home and then at home, I, I, I figured, you know, maybe I should YouTube, Google about DMT, right? Instead of doing that before I do it, I did it after I did it. And, um, and it says, a Harvard study, says you're connected to an, a universal uh, universe, a, a different universe. And I go, that's weird. So I click on it and right away you see the earth and you see another universe and there's a freaking wormhole in, bet in between. I go, do it. I saw that wormhole. You know, it was not like I saw it before and then I did DMT. No, I had no clue it was there. But the explanation was like, I was about to go into that wormhole and get over to the other side. So yeah, I, I did it and I, I was being guided by a bunch of people and I, I, I took it and shot away, right? Just like you said, I see these like little beings, but once I get through it, they're dragging across like a screen. And then all of a sudden I, I had the same experience where, where you're there, but then I was in a room with these beings and they didn't speak English. They, 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 they spoke something that I could understand and the first thing they said is, why are you here? And then they were like, you're not supposed to be here yet. And they went through this whole thing, uh, you know, took me through my past lives, took me through all these things, what I was supposed to be doing, why I, should, why I shouldn't try to even think about going to another world right now. And then they said, all right, now go play. And from that point on, that's where I got to, I was actually flying around and I was flying around in different parts. My dog was there, right? My dog was there. And keep in mind, I had like 10 people watching me as I was going through this. My dog shows up in the vision, starts talking to me. Yeah. And uh, these people who were watching me while I was curled up, <clears throat> they saw at the time me curled up, growling back and forth with my dog, like wow. in real life. And my dog was like guiding me through all these different things. So I keep my dog with me all the time now. Yeah. She, she doesn't leave my side. Yeah. And uh, it, it was an absolutely insane, insane thing. <laughs> people who go in with, with the, the healer box, what they call them. There's these little things that float around. There's people going in with injuries. And then these little healer box is what they call them. They start going through this injury and they come out of it four minutes later and the injury is gone. So that's my next one. I want to go, I want to talk to the healer box. I go, because I had four neck surgeries. I lost my arm, you know, atrophied, all that stuff. That would be great if something can happen there. So yeah, that, that's for next time. That's amazing. Well, boss, dude, thank you so much. Great conversation here. And uh, like I said, guys, get out there, check this stuff out and uh, let us know if you have any questions. And like I said, get out there and live your best lives. While that's you it. Can. All right, brother.